Welcome to prayer meeting. Our devotional thoughts come from James chapter 3, starting at verse 13, and then we're going to read into chapter 4, verse 3, and then drop down to verse 7, okay? I call our thoughts, you had better draw near to God. <laughs> How about that? Does that sound like a threat or an admonition? Well, it's an admonition, okay? It's not a threat. But there's a context. Verse 13 through 18 says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Paul asked a question at the beginning of this reading. Who is wise and understanding among you? Well, Paul's question has to do with selecting people that are qualified to teach. That's really what he's talking about. But if you kind of listen to what follows that, you see there is also a little sense of sarcasm in what he asks. Wisdom and understanding are shown through people's behavior, not just what they say. And the point Paul is making is line up your words with your behavior, or line up your behavior with your words. And you know, I'm just amazed uh, as we go through the ep epistles how many times this is brought up that talk is cheap. People talk a lot. But talk proves nothing. You have to have behavior that matches the gospel for your talk to mean anything. Now people that are genuine show wisdom and understanding through their meekness, according to Paul. Barnes writes a comment on this thought. He wrote, with a wise and prudent gentleness of life, pay attention, not in a noisy, arrogant, and boastful manner. True wisdom is always meek, mild, gentle, and that is the wisdom which is needful if men would become public teachers. It is remarkable that the truly wise man is always characterized by a calm spirit, a mild and placid demeanor, and by a gentle, though firm, enunciation of his sentiments. A noisy, boisterous, and stormy declaimer we never select as a safe counselor. He may accomplish much in his way by his bold eloquence of manner, but we do not put him in places where we need far-reaching thought or where we expect the exercise of profound philosophical views. In an eminent degree, the ministry of the gospel should be characterized by a calm, gentle, and thoughtful wisdom, a wisdom which shines in all the actions of life. Can we say amen to that? Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? All right. Do you know anyone that's like that? Well, that's the character of the person that you need to uh, place in, in ministry in the church. Now, there are those among the church that want to be thought of as wise and full of understanding, but their lives just do not set the right example. Everyone else but themselves recognize them for what they are, and that is self-seeking. <laughs> Do you know anyone like that? Maybe you've met 
one or two around. But they don't see it as being self-seeking, but those that are truly humble and meek people will see that. So these people are really lying against the truth. That's what Paul said. Their influence is not godliness. Instead, Paul says their influence is demonic. And it actually drives people away from the gospel. Paul says that their lives create confusion and every evil thing. That's sad. And they are totally oblivious to this. But notice the traits of true wisdom. Quite the opposite. It's pure. It's peaceable. It's gentle. It's full of mercy and good fruits. And it is without partiality and without hypocrisy. You can't pretend to those things. Either you are or you are not. Now, going into chapter 4, verses 1, 2, and 3, Paul asks, where do wars and fights come among you? I mean, James, not Paul. Uh, he says, do not they come from your desires for pleasure, that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and do not obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. <clears throat> you ask and you do not see, receive. Why? Because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. It certainly doesn't sound like the wise and understanding people that Paul described. Sounds like church problems to me, right? Sound like church problems to you? Well, church problems are very bad. But there is bad that can undermine the work of God before there is even a whole out church fight. And that's the influence of these people that Paul is speaking against. Uh, the Li Living Bible says this, translates this verse, what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Isn't it because there is a whole army of e evil desires within you? You want what you don't have, so you kill to get it. You long for what others have and can't afford it, so you start a fight to take it away from them. And yet the reason you don't have what you want is that you don't ask God for it. Wow. This is being said of church people. You notice I said church people, not necessarily Christians. I don't think these people are truly born again people. Uh, they are uh, doing things and they have attitudes that are so ungospel like so unchrist like They want what they don't have. Well, what is it that they want and don't have? Influence. Influence. And for people to look up upon them as being real saints of God. They want that reputation. They want to believe that that is their influence. But they don't really have it. And John, uh, James says, you kill to get it. Now, I don't think he's really talking about these people physically killing other church people. <clears throat> he's speaking uh, figuratively. So how are they going to kill? Well, they're willing to undermine and kill the good influence of the real saints of God in order to steal away the admiration they want. Look at me. And they will do anything and everything they can to undermine the influence of the real saints of God, to lift themselves up. Look at me. Look at me. Listen, jealousy has no place among God's people. It always hurts people. Jealousy always hurts people. And 
it convinces the world that there's nothing to Christianity. So seeing this kind of a person, the world wants nothing to do with the church. And that's sad. That is really sad. James sums up the self-seeker. He says, you want only what will give you pleasure. That's the self-seeker. Now, the church needs people with God-given wisdom and understanding. He needs you to be that kind of a person. Now, you may not be the pastor of the church. You may not be a Sunday school teacher or a young people's leader. But listen, you have influence with people around you. Okay? It isn't just me. It isn't just brother and sister Williams and sister Bayless. It's all of us. And we need, you need, wisdom that comes from God. And James says, ask for it. You need wisdom. You need understanding. Ask God for it. See, you need understanding that comes from living close to God and constantly obeying the Word of God. That's where you gain this wisdom and understanding in real life experience with God. Then going down to verse 7 in the first part of verse 8, James writes, Therefore submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So, how do we get wisdom and understanding? Draw near to God. Draw near to God. That is a choice you get to make for yourself. The devil is very real. The devil trolls around the church looking for people that have not consecrated their self-interest to God. And he can smell it. He recognizes it in people. And he comes to them and he convinces them that they are the wise ones with understanding. They believe they should have the influence more than the other people in the congregation have. Well, they are deluded into believing their bitter envy and self-seeking are really godly virtues. They are so deluded by Satan that they think that the wrong things, the wrong attitudes, the wrong things they do are really godly virtues. And the rest of us are childish. The rest of us are just, we just don't get it, okay? So they do not recognize the confusion they create. And when problems arrive, they attribute those problems to everyone else in the church, not themselves. Well, James gives us a twofold solution. First he says, submit to God. Submit to God. What, is, what does that mean? First of all, be saved from sin. Are you saved from sin today? Second, consecrate to God's leading. Be committed to whatever God shows you, you're going to do. And then get to know God through prayer, through reading scripture, and through being under godly teaching. Get to know God. Second, James says, resist the devil. Yield to God in all things and never yield to the devil in anything. Okay? Now, let me ask you a question. Can you tell the difference between God and the devil? Hmm. Well, Mr. Barnes gives us some traits of the devil that you should learn to recognize. 
He says, Satan makes his way and secures his triumphs rather by art, cunning, deception, and threatenings. Those are all bad things. Cunning, trickery, deception, making something bad look like it's good, and threatenings. The devil will come up and say, well, if you don't do it this way, you're going to go to hell. Yeah, the devil would tell people that. <laughs> or, you better do it this way if you want to go to heaven. Threatenings. Yes, the devil actually does threaten some people into doing things that are wrong. So, if you cannot recognize the devil, then you lack wisdom and you lack understand. So, draw near to God. God always responds to people that make sincere efforts to know Him and to live for Him. God always responds to people that try, make the effort. And then resist the devil. And James says, he will flee from you. What a glorious promise that is. When does the devil come? Well, he comes in times of temptation, right? Resist the devil. Do you recognize temptation when it comes? Resist the devil through the grace of God, but be consecrated to God. I'm not going to go the devil's way. But sometimes the devil comes with those thoughts in your mind. Maybe he's not tempting you to smoke a cigarette or to say a cuss word or to look at a dirty picture. Not doing that. But he comes with a thought, I just don't have to do what the preacher said. I don't really need to read my Bible every day. I can, I can tell a dirty joke at school. Well, I, I won't tell it, but I'll listen to a dirty joke at school. Where do those things come from? They come from the devil. And what did James say to do? Resist the devil. Now, you can't stop a thought from coming into your head. But you know what would be a good thing to do when you recognize that thought's in your head? Devil, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> God, I don't want to think those thoughts. And the Bible says that when draw, you draw near to God, God draws near to you. He's the one that will give you the strength let that thought go away to resist that temptation. So, resist the devil and he will flee from you, but God draws near you. That's even a better promise than the other. So, what did James say to us today? You'd better draw near God. That's where the wisdom and understanding is. That's what will make your life what God wants it to be. Amen.